Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this specialized session, but a very important session. Uh, my name is Guy Berger. I work for UNESCO as Director for Freedom of Expression and Media Development. And uh, we have some very, very interesting people on our panel. Uh, and we also have um, my co-director, Indrajit Banerjee, sitting at the side over here, who will make some final remarks at the end. So I'll make some introductory remarks, and then I'll hand it over to our different people. So um, you hear about uh, UNESCO's concept of internet universality. Some of you may have heard about it from other places or other times and other IGFs. And now it's taken a step forward with uh, these indicators. So the idea is that really these indicators could give legs to this concept, really make it very, very useful at a practical level. I think what's important about this concept that UNESCO member states adopted in 2015 is that Internet universality is based on a, four principles, R-O-A-M. And why we thought that was important uh, at UNESCO is because rights, which is the R, is very important, but rights without openness on the Internet means you don't really have the Internet. Rights without accessibility to the Internet is a bit empty. And the whole package really works best when you have multi-stakeholder participation in key decisions that are shaping the uh, Internet and Internet policies. So that's why you have this uh, holistic perspective, R-O-A-M. Now, what happened uh, is that we d got a mandate from our member states to try to take this broad normative concept, which is very helpful in terms of saying how we can think about the Internet as the whole elephant, rather than people feeling a leg here, an arm, I mean, a, not an arm, e elephants don't have arms, a trunk there, a tail there. This perspective gives you a, a sense of the elephant as a whole. And so the, the value of getting uh, this concept to actually have um, the ability to take shape on the ground is that UNESCO wanted to uh, say, uh, how can we make a useful tool for voluntary application by countries to take an assessment of the internet in its, in its holistic character and see where improvements can be made. Now, any elephant, of course, uh, ultimately you want an elephant to be w walking on all four legs and not to have one leg, like accessibility, dragging behind and the elephant stumbling along. You know, all four legs should be going well and the, ele and the elephant should be balanced on all four legs. But the elephant also has a stomach. So um, I want to say here that we're very much thankful at UNESCO to CEDA and to the Internet Society. Uh, we have Raul Echeverria over here, Internet Society, who's been a big supporter of this. So the, you have helped this elephant uh, get some nutrition to, to move forward a bit. I also want to acknowledge we have an advisory board of international experts. We have uh, Mr. Andre Calderero uh, over here. Anybody else here who's on the international advisory board? Ah, and Stefan. So uh, thank you for those who, you know, who are giving us feedback. Now, these indicators we're developing uh, with a, a group that we contracted called the Association of Progressive Communications, uh, uh, Henriette uh, Esther is, is here, and I'll introduce her later. And they've been doing with us consultations worldwide. So far, we had 25 global consultations in different face-to-face. -face. And we have a website in six languages. And we have some submissions. And I met a young man here, and he said he made a submission. And I said, yes, it's taken into account. <laughs> so uh, fantastic. So that was phase one. The phase one was what is important to measure. If you're looking at rights, we're not going to measure every single right. It's just you know, each one could be a PhD dissertation, let alone just one part of an indicator. So we asked people, what rights should we look at? And we, we, we got various suggestions, and then... Uh, we try to find out what uh, people have in common, what's the motivation, what's the logic, what's practical, what would be useful. So that was phase one, what should we look at? Now we're in phase two, where we actually have populated this indicator template with some proposed indicators. And on behalf of the APC, uh, uh, David Suter on my left has been the one who's done this population. So now this is phase two. Phase one, what should go in? Phase two, draft contents. Uh, we will also have some continued phases. Uh, this, uh, after we get these comments, the indicators will be further improved. And then we want to pre-test them, and we want to pilot them. And after the pre-testing, improve them a bit more. After piloting them, improve them a bit more. 
By November next year, we want to submit these to the UNESCO member states and say, these are really road tested. We've consulted around the world. We have lots of wisdom. We've been in uh, uh, cities all over. We've been in Johannesburg, Hanoi, Buenos Aires, uh, Moscow. We've been all over asking people what they think could be in these uh, indicators. So we'll say to the member states here, will you give this your blessing as a useful tool, a voluntary tool that has a UNESCO imprimatur on it that can be used uh, in a multi-stakeholder fashion to make an assessment of internet in your country and identify where improvements could be made. So with that uh, introductory comment, let me uh, introduce you to David Souter, and uh, he can then jump straight into the substance of the issue. Uh, David Souter is a, I think, very well-known person to all of you. He's um, uh, a long-standing consultant to UNCTAD, uh, to uh, ITU, to UNESCO, a professor at LSE. There's some protégés of his in the room. <laughs> and he's worked a lot with UNESCO in the past, also in the WISA space. So, David, um, thank you for your support and uh, hard work so far. And please, if you could uh, introduce the subject, and then we'll get some responses from the panel. Then we'll throw it open to everybody. Okay, so thank you very much, Guy. Um, what I'll try to do in um, about 15 minutes is give an introduction to um, a little bit more about the aims and process of the, of the project, an introduction to the proposed framework, and uh, say a little bit about the consultation that's going to be, well, that's already started for the second phase of the, of the work. So I'm hoping to take no more than about 15 minutes on this. Uh, and I'll begin with the next slide, which is um, on, so if you can change the slide. Um, the roots of the project, uh, I think there are actually, uh, there are two roots of the project that is worth bearing in mind. So Guy has talked about one of these, uh, which is the uh, UNESCO Inter Internet Universality Approach, which was a, uh, adopted, I think, in 2014? 15. 15, by the General uh, Conference. And that's built around these four principles of rights, uh, openness, accessibility for all, and uh, multi-stakeholder participation. Um, but there's a second route as well, which is uh, UNESCO's past experience in indicator frameworks of a similar kind, in particular the media development indicators, which were adopted at another date, which Guy could probably tell me, uh, but about 10 years ago, I think. Um, uh, and it, when you look at this particular framework here, um, you may say to yourself, there are a lot of indicators in this. This is pretty much similar in kind of uh, overall numbers of proposed indicators and, and style of content to the media development indicators, which have been used successfully in around 30 countries over that time, which I uh, used myself in, uh, in analysis. Um, so there's quite a, a large number of indicators here. They're qualitative and quantitative, uh, and indeed institutional. They enable a group of investigators to put together a collage of evidence, and they've got a proven track record in the sense of the media development indicators following a similar pattern. And the purpose of these indicators on the next slide is to support governments and other stakeholders in, I think, actually three ways. First, in developing a clear understanding of the national internet environment, especially as it relates to UNESCO's priorities here. Second, in assessing where that national environment meets the Rome principles and where more attention is needed to address them. And then thirdly, to develop a policy development policy development recommendations or proposals that would respond to those deficiencies. And so it's about identifying constructive ways forward for individual countries. Um, it's not, and be very specific about this, it's not intended as a basis for cross-country comparisons. It's not that kind of indicator framework. Um, there's a special focus in it on gender and on children and young people, and it's also developed within the framework of the Sustainable Development Agenda. A few quick words on the, the consortium and uh, the way in which the work's being done. So as Guy said, the consortium is led by APC, Association for Progressive Communications, and it includes four other organizations. ICD Development Associates is, is my own organization. And there are three research centers from different developing regions. So Research ICT Africa, Learn Asia, and DERSI, which is a Latin American research center. And Guy has discussed the project timeline, which is on this slide. The key point in which is that there are two phases. Phase one we have had so far, very extensive consultation, 165 online contributions, 25 face-to-face uh, -face fora. Uh, the second phase is beginning now and is on this particular set of draft proposals, which have been developed from desk research plus the inputs that were made in that first consultation process. 
um, illustrating here the website for that consultation uh, process. Um, so the, there is two phases, two types of consultation, online consultation, face-to-face -face meetings such as this, plus a multi-stakeholder advisory board of exp experts, which Guy also mentioned. So let me turn to the, the Rome framework. Um, and um, there are four principles within the Rome framework, and there are five categories of indicators within the indicator framework that, it, that is being proposed here. Um, so the Rome framework includes these four areas, rights-based indicators, openness indicators, accessibility to all indicators, and multi-stakeholder indicators. And to those, we have added a fifth group, which is cross-cutting indicators. Now, those cross-cutting indicators are meant to be very broad um, public policy goals of the international community. Uh, for example, gender equity, for example, sustainable development. And so issues that emerge within those that cut across all four of the Rome uh, principles. Um, and the, within that category, as we'll see later, those issues which are raised within that category are supplementary to what is in the, the overall indicator framework. So for example, in looking at the impact, or the, looking at uh, the internet environment from a gender perspective, um, that requires an assessment of all five categories, not just those supplementary issues which are within the gender component of the cross-cutting category. Um, there's a structure to this framework, and I'll explain that now. Um, so the structure is built around the five categories, and within each of those five categories, there are a number of themes. And what's illustrated on the slide here are those themes within the rights category. So there are six themes within the rights category. Uh, the overall legal and regulatory framework, freedom of expression, the right to information, uh, um, the right of association and part rights of association and participation, privacy, and economic, social, and cultural rights. So there are six themes within that category, and within each of those themes, there are a number of questions which are asked and indicators associated with those questions, either one indicator or a number of indicators associated with those questions. In the final framework um, document, there will also be a section on sources and means of verification, which will give guidance to potential users of the indicator framework on the places they should look for. I mean, both the, the kind of broad formulation of what they're trying to assess and also the specific um, information that they need to do an assessment. One or two other points around this. Um, so the indicator framework includes three types of indicator. Um, quantitative indicators. So quantitative indicators are available for some areas of this, uh, particularly accessibility to all. Um, but for many of the issues that are raised within the Rome framework, that it is very difficult to achieve quantitative indicators. And in any event, quantitative evidence is quite limited in many countries. So there is also extensive use of qualitative indicators in which we're uh, proposing that those undertaking an assessment um, use credible sources within the country concerned and develop their understanding of how far um, a particular goal is met or a particular question is uh, the, the, the the issues in a particular question are achieved. And finally, there are, there are what we call institutional um, arrangements indicators. So these are to do with whether or not there is a particular policy framework in place within a, a government, uh, whether there is a particular institution within government, and associated with that, how that policy or institution is, is, is implemented. Uh, so there's three kinds of, of indicators. And as I say, they're, they're structured along themes, Questions, sorry, can you put the next slide up? Themes, questions, uh, indicators, and there will also be sources and means of verification. So I've got three more general points I want to make before I sort of introduce the framework itself. Um, on the left-hand side of this slide here, you'll see a list of six um, criteria for selection of indicators. And these are criteria that we have adapted from those in the media development indicators and then applied in this particular context. It's very important to have consistent and coherent uh, indicators throughout uh, an indicator framework like this and for those to 
to apply in a, in a way that is feasible uh, for researchers to undertake. Um, so you'll see the points that are raised here. Each indicator should address one issue, not a multiplicity of issues. Measurement data should be reliable and allow confident decision making. Um, quantitative where possible, qualitative where appropriate. Independently verifiable, permitting disaggregation by gender and other population groups, and it should be possible to gather data at a reasonable cost in most countries. And that last one is particularly important. Um, we are trying to develop here something that can be used by researchers in very wide-ranging contexts, but remain consistent across those contexts. And for that purpose, we need to be clear that there are limits to what can be included in, a, in the framework, as well as, uh, as, well as, uh, as scope and scale. So, Indicator frameworks um, need to be um, sufficiently broad to allow this uh, kind of collage of evidence to be gathered, um, but they should not be so broad that it is impossible for, a, uh, for, them to be, for the evidence to be gathered reasonably by, sufficient, by, by, by people within a mission um, with the limited resources that are available to them. And that does limit the number of indicators you can have. The number in this current set of proposals is around the same as in the media development indicators. My own feeling from experience is that that's pretty large. Yeah. Um, and that, um, uh, so, you know, the, the temptation is always to add more. Actually, in terms of managing a process of, of using something like this, it's generally better to reduce rather than increase the numbers that you have. You don't have to be comprehensive. Um, so, the uh, other point I'd make here um, is, uh, no, I, I just give a couple of examples here of, of how these questions and indicators work. So, the first of the, on the, the left-hand side is uh, the quest a question from the freedom of expression um, section. Uh, so, one question, is freedom of expression guaranteed in law, respected in practice, and widely exercised? And three proposed indicators which would address that question. Uh, on the right-hand side, a more quanti quantitative um, uh, question from the accessibility to all section of the proposal. Are broadband networks geographically available throughout the country? And three possible indicators that would uh, address that, all of which are in practice gathered by the ITU. David, if I can just jump in before. Yep. Um, Stephen, are those more copies under there of the documents? Um, if anybody would like a copy, because it's quite useful, I think, as David proceeds, you can see. Yeah, there are more here. Even. And there are more here. So, um, anybody else like a copy? I'm so, sorry to interrupt you, but I no, think it will be useful if people yeah, can yeah, page yeah, through absolutely. while we're yeah. down there. So. Uh, thank you so much to Stephen, who's a speaker, and now we ask him to do some um, legwork for us. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, David, uh, I think let's uh, jump back in and, and try to... Yeah, okay. so um, as you get those documents to look at, um, as I say, the, the, this particular document has been developed through desk research and a very extensive consultation process, both online and offline. Um, and it proposes questions and indicators that um, we feel and UNESCO feels meet the, uh, the requirement here. But they are proposals, they're, dra they're a draft for discussions who are, and further development through the next consultation process. So we are asking you in this second consultation phase, and that includes this meeting, to think about three things, the three questions that are on the screen there. So are there additional themes, questions, or indicators which you think should be included in the framework? Uh, bearing in mind, obviously, what I've what just said think? about the need to um, keep within the limits of what is feasible for researchers in the majority of countries. Second, are there suggestions that you'd make in respect of the proposed themes, questions, and indicators which are in here? And thirdly, what sources and means of verification would you recommend from your experience in relation to the questions and indicators that are being proposed? So we have our own, we're doing our own work obviously on sources and means of verification, but 
um, advice from those who have experience in all different contexts will be immensely helpful in uh, putting that together. Now, obviously, in this meeting here, we can't go through these on an individual indicator basis. Uh, so what we're hoping uh, we, you will do is take this away and you will make your contributions online. And here, you will also make initial contributions to us, either on individual points or on more general issues, that we can take, take forward. As I say, this is, a, this is um, a draft for consultation. It's not meant to be a final document. Uh, so uh, everything you say will be taken down in writing and paid attention to over the next, uh, the, the, the remaining part of the work. So what I'll now do is just quickly run through the different sections the, so, uh, of, the, uh, of the proposed framework. That is the five, uh, the five categories plus one more I'll mention in a second um, and the themes within those categories and give some examples of the questions that are being asked in, in each of them. So as a reminder, um, those are the five categories of the, um, of the proposed framework. To those five categories, we have added one further set of indicators, and those are contextual indicators. Um, context matters when you're assessing a national internet environment um, because it affects what is, is possible to do. Um, so these are, it, it affects how, you will in, how users of the framework will interpret the Romex indicators um, and how they will develop relevant policy recommendations arising from them. Um, so they're important, in deter in the, they're important factors in how the internet has evolved within a country and they're important factors in constraining the policy options which are available to governments and other stakeholders arising from that context. Um, so it's crucial to understand them. We're proposing 20 contextual indicators and all of these, they're in these six categories, but all of them um, are derived directly from data sets produced by or gathered by the United Nations agencies or other international organizations. So this is not something that is a burdensome requirement on those undertaking assessments here. It's a quick way of setting out where a country stands in relation to the rest of the world. So to turn to the, um, the categories themselves, the first category is rights, and in rights we have identified six themes uh, the overall policy, legal, and regulatory framework, and we've adopted that, <coughs> that as a, the first theme in each of the four Rome categories. Um, and then five others, um, so freedom of expression and the right to information, both of which are derived from Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, uh, freedom of association and the right to participate in public life, uh, which are also derived from that uh, covenant, uh, privacy, likewise derived from that covenant, and social, economic, and cultural rights um, derived from the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. I don't know why I changed the order of those three words. Mm -hmm. um, these are some examples, um, one from each of those six themes of the issues which are addressed by the questions and indicators. Um, and. Um, <coughs> so they're just examples to have a, a quick look at, and they're illustrative. Um, they don't give you the overall scope. To get, to get the overall scope, you'll need to look in the booklet. Second category is openness. Um, Guy said a little about openness. Again, we have at the beginning of this the policy, legal, and regulatory framework, and then we have four subsidiary areas of openness. So open standards, uh, open markets and, com uh, and competition, um, open content and open data. And again, here are some examples from one from each of those five themes within the openness category of the issues that are covered within the proposed framework. Uh, the third category is accessibility to all. Uh, again, beginning with the policy, legal, and regulatory framework, and then taking five dimensions of accessibility. Um, so connectivity and usage, affordability, equitable access, by which we mean um, uh, access, uh, the relationship between different sec sections of the community, sections of society, local content and language, and competences and capabilities. And again, here are some examples, one from each of those six themes. <coughs> um, the fourth category 
is multi-stakeholder participation, uh, where there are three themes, policy, legal, and, and regulatory framework, national internet governance, and inter international internet governance. And some examples from those are on this slide. And then finally, we have the cross-cutting uh, group, the cross-cutting category, in which there are five themes. So I said earlier this was initially intended to um, contain very broad uh, global policy goals, um, gender equity, um, the, um, the requirements of children and young people, and sustainable development. And two of those have been added to, uh, to sorry, uh, two other cross-cutting themes, um, trust and security, and legal and ethical aspects of the internet. Um, so that fifth category is meant to consist of things that cut right across all of the other four. Um, and um, these are important themes uh, which need to be engaged with when also thinking about each of the other four themes. We hope that they'll be investigated in depth, in other words. Um, uh, and when addressing these, it's going to be important not just to look at the indicators that are here, which are supplementary, but also at those indicators across the whole theme. So I, I said, I mentioned this specifically in relation to gender equity. Um, it's e equally true in particular of children and young people and of sustainable development. Um, that you can't get a picture of those themes just from these indicators you'll only get a picture of those themes from these indicators plus those in the other four themes. Um, some examples of those that are here, for example, uh, then um, in those um, categories. One of the things I, I didn't mention earlier, which I think is, is worth mentioning, is that, yes, um, it would be good for comprehensive assessments to be made across the Romex framework, and um, that is the primary intention of these but we don't exclude uh, in any sense the possibility of people undertaking um, narrower um, uh, investigations that look at only particular categories or particular mm. dimensions of it. Uh, so this isn't meant to be a fixed, you know, that you do this or nothing. Um, this is meant to be something that can be adapted and developed and used in different ways by different people to suit the different contexts in which they're working and their own different requirements. Uh, so that diversity is an important part of it. It's not, after all, it's not intended to compare country A with country B with country C. It's intended to investigate each individual country and explore where it meets the Rome principles, where it doesn't, what might be done to address that, and make policy recommendations as a result. So I'll return to the, the three questions uh, that we're asking in this second consultation, um, uh, which are those three questions there. There will be six language websites, um, but at the moment it's only on, online in, in English, but uh, in the near future it will be available in uh, six languages, uh, six UN languages. Um, and I'll hand the floor back to Guy. Yes, thank you so much, uh, David. And uh, I see some people just came in. If you'd like to get a, a copy, because uh, you've got... Anybody else need a copy, please? Um, yeah, it's, it's the same. It's the same. Okay, good. So uh, we've asked uh, uh, quite a lot of people, uh, but we said we need just short inputs from them, and then we'll throw it open, then we'll get back to them as well. So the first person we asked especially to think a bit about, um, so far, the, the state of uh, the, the, the project as regards the proposed indicators for rights, and particularly from a gender point of view. So we have Anriet uh, Esther Hez, who I mentioned before, she has been executive director of APC, Association of Progressive Communications, for many years. And now she is APC's director for policy and strategy. And amongst many other achievements, she has a BA in musicology. You don't so, have to say it. So, 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 uh, 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 actually a master's. A master's. Oh, the, well, uh, um, uh, uh, what we'd like to hear from you is make us some music, Henriette. A short, a short um, song. Um, thanks very much, Guy. I, I won't say too much because David gave a fairly detailed uh, presentation. But just to, to use, and I won't say that much about um, um, more about gender, what we're trying to do with this, firstly, and I think this is important, you'll see often that there's reference to disaggregated data. So almost in every area, you'll find that we are looking for data that's disaggregated by age, 
by gender and in other forms as well. And I think part of this is us wanting to form a relationship with people who gather data in the country, be they national statistical agencies or research academic institutions or even people in the internet national registries, for example. So we're really trying to, to encourage the practice of always of gathering data around the internet and also making sure it's disaggregated. As David said, we're dealing with gender through a cross cut, so there's a set of indicators, um, themes around gender, but you'll also find if you go, for example, to um, accessibility, you'll find that there's a what, theme. What page is that? So if you go to page 17, which is category A, accessibility to all, A being one of the ROAM principles, and then if you page to 19, you'll see there's theme D, theme D under accessibility, equitable access. And if you turn the page, you'll see the first area there, D2, is there a gender digital divide in internet access and use? So as David said, even if one went in and if a country or a group of organizations or, or a, a public sector entity or government wanted to home in just on accessibility, they will still have to look at the gender dimension and the equitable access from a gender perspective. So, so that's how the, so the cross cuts don't stand alone. They pull out certain areas, but we also try and mainstream important areas such as um, gender, such as um, children and youth in the other indicators. I think similarly with rights, you'll find that there's a cross cutting area right at the end of the book, page 29, trust and security. And um, the final crosscut group E, legal and ethical aspects of the internet. And you'll find that some of the very specific rights related uh, issues are also covered there. So, um, and I think that's really, really all there is to say. I think we've tried to design this in such a way that um, it can work with slices, but even those slices, if you home in on just accessibility, it will still give you a fairly holistic picture. And that's how we, that, that was one, okay. of, one of our goals. Thank you. Uh, that was really a, a sweet song, to the point, short, uh, very informative. Our next uh, commentator is Prof. Uh, Zhu Hong from China Normal University. Uh, prof, the Prof is also not only there, she's also a guest professor at Torino Law School, Microsoft Fellow at Yale Information Society, and she's on the ICANN uh, Council for CCNSOs. So, Prof Hong, thank you so much, and you are going to give us, according to my notes here, uh, a few comments on the openness indicators in particular. Okay. So, uh, if you do, it's three minutes, please, and then we'll, oh, we, we'll move on and then we'll come back again afterwards. Oh, sure. I have some quick comments on openness. I'm particularly interested in um, open data and the open market. Let's go to open data first. On page 15, um, it has been stated at the beginning, uh, the open data that's being mentioned here refers to the publicly available data uh, gathered by the government. Um, so I suggest it would be better to mention that this is not about personal data, they're normally subject to privacy protection. And let's turn the page to page 16. Um, I uh, draw your attention uh, to question E3 and E5. Uh, I think these two questions are related. For E3, it's primarily about the easy access to these publicly available uh, data and data sets. And E5 is about the people's uh, use and share these data. I think these are two issues that should be connected, not only enable people to access the data easily, but also to use and share the data, uh, since these are public data. Um, at E3, it mentioned including machine-readable access. Oh, definitely, this is access data online, so it must be machine-readable. I would suggest we add something like uh, to provide user-friendly data format to make it interoperable. So is, that's really enabled the easy access. Well, I hope this is the meaning of this question, E3 and 5. Uh, for E4, um, I, I think this is extremely important indicator 
the location and duration of data retention. Um, I I've, have I've, I've two questions, actually. One is about international standards. I would be very happy to know what is the sources of the international standard, if it's available at all. And also, I suggest add a few words about whether this requirements restricting cross-border data flow. All right, that's my quick comment. Well, thank you so much for such high-quality comments, and maybe we'll ask David to respond at the, at the end of everything if he's got a few comments, but we are taking note, and uh, certainly these are good points. So the next uh, brief comments we got is from Stephen Weiber, who's Manager for Policy and Advocacy at IFLA. And uh, we all know in, in today's International Federation of Library Associations and Institutions, <laughs> according to my notes. Okay. So um, broader only than libraries, but uh, they have 1,400 members in 140 countries. Uh, Stephen is a great uh, supporter of uh, information for all and, uh, uh, and uh, participant in many U UNESCO activities. So Stephen, we were going to ask you to uh, speak, speak specifically about the access, access, accessibility to all. Uh, thank you very much and thanks for the opportunity to speak because clearly libraries have always formed an information network and so we're glad to be able to bring some of the centuries of reflection on how this should function to the work of UNESCO here. So and I should start with a compliment. I'm sure you'll hear lots about the work that's taken place, that this is really shaping up to be a really amazing resource, not just for organizations like ours, but also for our 1,400 members at the national level and their members in the two million institutions and many millions more professionals who are trying to think broadly about the work they're doing. Um, I think even to talk of indicators may give an unfairly limited idea of the value this work is going to provide because the information that you're going to be connecting and providing an analysis here is going to be so useful for everyone. And especially if you're focusing on the confirmation, on verification of whether there are plans, but are plans being implemented? Are there budgets available? Is there a serious commitment? Is going to be, that's going to be utterly essential. So I won't dwell on small points because we'll cover those in our response to the consultation. Um, I think the access, point, the access section provides a lot of the material that we need to be able to understand what share of the population is suffering from information poverty at the moment. We've talked a lot about people being underconnected. For us, we tend to talk about information poverty as a concept, the share of the population who simply isn't able to access the information and the services required to fulfill their objectives, to live a, a full and happy life and take advantage of all the possibilities for personal development. Um, of course, I owe it to myself to talk about public access. I admit I'd caution against presenting it as something that's only for those who are unconnected or who can't afford it. People use different types of access, home, mobile, public, for different reasons. Even as home access expands, the use of library facilities doesn't seem to be falling off. It's important also to avoid giving the impression that public access is a sort of poor man's internet. We shouldn't be stigmatizing people who need to use the internet for free. Um, I think the references to culture, admittedly this in the rights section, are important because if we're talking about making access meaningful, that cultural element is really, really important. Um, I hope we'll be able to dig a little deeper than talking about a reference to policy on cultural heritage online. Are we facilitating preservation, access, and creation in a digital age? Um, a lot of work is already going on in UNESCO on this subject, and I hope we'll be able to draw on it. Um, Clearly also we should be talking about research and innovation as well. These also feature in Article 27 of the Universal Declaration. So it's access to innovation, access to science, access to new ideas. We should be covering the board on this. Um, I also have to talk about IP. I'm sorry about this. Um, we talk a little bit about enforcement. We're not talking about policies. There's been some interesting work presented at WIPO recently, which shows that whereas we've been quite good at creating new rights, in the digital age, we're not really keeping up in terms of the exceptions and limitations that allow people to use the material. So making sure we're digging down. There's a lot of talk about this elsewhere. I would argue that copyright deserves more attention at IGF in general, but this is worth looking at. Um, on accessibility for people with disabilities, I hope we'll be able to see evidence of what other actors are doing to make websites available. Um, I, I don't think I've ever gone on a website, a government website for fun or for personal fulfillment. Normally it's because I have to fill in my tax or something. So making sure there's a, a broad range of websites really accessible for people with disabilities will be very important. When talking about local content, only two more things, we should also be focusing on services. It's not just accessing materials, it's accessing apps, it's accessing services, it's accessing an offer that means that the internet is relevant, that people can do things rather than just consume online. 
this will link in clearly with a focus on skills and actually the ability to create things online, which is, is, is super valuable and make sure that it's not just everyone consuming Western material. So overall, I think that a lot of the elements are there. It's going to be the interplay of the different indicators, the interplay of the different information that's really going to tell a, a fantastically interesting story about is access meaningful? I know are people achieving their own objectives for health, learning, work, and, and broader personal development online? But this is a really great project, and we're really looking, we're really glad to be involved. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I, and I, I do hope you'll send us your notes that to, uh, so we can <laughs> and, and give us even more detailed comments. That's excellent. So our next commentator is Ms. Dorothy Gordon, who's a Ghanaian technology activist, development specialist. Um, she's a former board member of Creative Commons and she's on the advisory council of Creative Commons, and she's also the deputy chair of UNESCO's Information for All program. So, Dorothy, your three minutes. Yeah. On access also, accessibility. Okay. Well, first of all, let me say that I think the design is very impressive. It allows us to manage huge quantity of information in a very logical way. So I was very pleased to look at it, and I'm not going to restrict myself um, just to access. Um, for example, right to information. If we look at page nine, we have D2, which ha has a title, Can Civil Society Organizations Organize Effectively Online? I found that a little bit too open-ended. You know, what is effective organization online? Um, so that sort of, then interestingly on page 11, you've got uh, data encryption and online anonymity protected in law and practiced, um, I've corrected that, in a way that is consistent with international rights agreements. This is a rapidly evolving space. Um, so perhaps we'll have to have a more in-depth look at it because it's changing um, so fast, and we've had some very good discussions here on this. Then we have on page 13, does the government facilitate free and open source software FOSS? I also feel that the word facilitates is a bit too open-ended, but I love the indicators. The indicators will allow us to really hone in, and as you know, I am a member of FOSFA, the Free and Open Source Foundation for Africa. Let me put a plug. If you're an African and you're not a member, please join. Okay. So um, I think that organizationally it would help us because as I was going through, being able to track when I was in open using the B1, B2, etc. Maybe if you start with O, B1, then it will always be clear. We're, this is the B1 referring to the yeah, open, sure. you know, something like that, just yeah. to help us. Um, but the, I was very excited about theme D, open content, and D1. Does the government actively promote access to knowledge through its policies for education, culture, and science? Tough one to measure in my view. Um, would you say that if a government is using taxpayers' money to buy software that locks them into a particular vendor, would that be promoting access to knowledge? You see what I mean? It's a can of worms in there. So maybe we need to decide which worms we are chasing. Um, under accessibility, we have uh, A2, is there a legal right to access the internet and online services? Uh, what, what page is that? Though? That is page 17. Okay. Um, just above that, I could say, are effective arrangements in place to monitor access and use of internet? And you refer to the regular household surveys. Um, is there any alternative to that, <coughs> using a technical tool that would allow us to do that, rather than the household surveys? 
in terms of use of the internet. I think we have alternative options because the household surveys are, are in many places very erratic and uh, opens up that question actually of who the data sources that we'll be looking at, but also which particular um, sets of organizations, individuals will actually be responsible for giving you the information that is needed for these indicators. Um, on the one I mentioned first, the A2, the legal act right to access the internet and online services. Um, tricky, tricky. What do you do if permission has been given for zero rating of different <coughs> kinds? Mm -hmm. huh? it's, it's tricky. I, I, I mean, I like it, but I'm just anticipating that there could be issues, and the same for A3. So, uh, uh, Dorothy, if I could just stop you there at the yeah. moment, just so we can come back. But um, can I just finish with skills? Right. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Give, us, give us one more challenge. <laughs> okay. The big, the I think the big challenge we have was on the capabilities um, and competencies, and you have under F3 the proportion of internet users with particular skills by skill type aggregate disaggregated the proportion of the workforce using icts in the workplace these issues are challenges for everybody we haven't got clear definitions so i can just see it being impossible for you to really get the information but let me say i really admire the amount of work that's gone in here and it's going to be delightful to take it to the country level and start the debate going. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's, re that's really wonderful. So our next commentator is uh, Yasmina Byrne uh, from UNICEF, who will comment on the question of youth and children yep. uh, and these indicators. Uh, she's Child Protection Specialist. She leads the UNICEF Office on Research, uh, which is called Innocenti, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, she focuses on children's rights in the digital age, she leads Global Kids Online Research Initiative, uh, 20 years of international experience managing these issues of child rights, protection programs, etc. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Guy. Um, I, I, I want to echo my um, uh, colleagues who were speaking before me and congratulate you on this document. I'm happy to see children's issues included. Um, both as a cross-cutting issue, uh, but I'll speak a little bit about it separately. A uh, couple of comments. Uh, it would be great to separate children and youth. Uh, there are different age groups. Uh, children's rights are distinctly guaranteed by the Convention on the Rights of the Child, and I'm sure that many youth wouldn't like to be lumped together with children in the same category. Uh, it would also be good to see this age desegregation. I know Arietta mentioned that it is there, but a little bit stronger in other, s in, in other sections, not only in a cross-cutting section on, on children and youth, particularly when it comes to issues as a right to privacy, a right to access to information, a right, right to freedom of assembly. They all have different implications when it comes to children in particular. Uh, maybe we need some <coughs> qualitative indicators also to capture these differences. Um, it is encouraging to see that you recommend tracking barriers uh, to access. Uh, that's also one of the recommendations that we have in the report we just launched, State of the Worlds of Children. I have uh, some copies here. Uh, just to mention that for children, these barriers may be different to barriers that adults face. In Ghana, for example, the results of the Global Kids Online show that 20% of children who don't have access, and there are about 60% of them, uh, is due to parental restrictions. So that's something that we need to take into account and unpack these barriers um, when, when you are doing um, uh, these indicators. Also to echo what Dorothy was saying, surveys um, are erratic. They don't happen all the time. Even our Global Kids Online that is now happening in 15 countries uh, is not going to happen every year. How do we make sure that this, uh, we generate these statistics? Uh, on, on concretely on the issues related to children, you, the indicators mention measuring um, education needs um, that uh, look into um, effective and safe use. I would just say that uh, they need to be broadened to include all aspects of digital literacy, safety skills, comprehension skills, social and emotional skills, and curation skills. As we see through our research, a very small percentage of children actually make the use of these more complex digital skills, even in countries where we consider them digital natives, they're not necessarily digitally literate. 
Um, finally, I would like to say that uh, it would be, I would like to propose an indicator that measures how much children and youth are engaged in the development of policies, either through their direct participation or through representation through other agencies who work with them and represent their interests. I'll be happy to share more, um, uh, more comments with David and others in writing as well. Thank you. That's interesting. So, uh, thank you so much, uh, Yasmina. Uh, I think that's uh, actually your engagement with us over the years has made us more sensitive to these issues. Uh, we're not there yet, but uh, thank you for those comments. That's a good point. So, uh, uh, our next speaker is Martin Scarpa. Scarpa. Excuse my pronunciation. Scarpa. Scarpa. Uh, who is, works for the ITU uh, uh, in statistics. I don't know his exact title now, and I hope he can tell us, but I know him from before because he used to work for the UNESCO Institute of Statistics. And he has been a great uh, supporter of us trying to develop stats, national statistics commission's capacity to look at media statistics. So I'm sure you, Martin, are going to be able to give us some ideas about from an ITU point of view, but also even from a national statistics capacity point of view uh, of engagement with these indicators. And please give us your current title, because I'm sorry I didn't have that. <laughs> yes, thank you, Guy. Um, I'm senior IST analyst now. And indeed, that was indeed what I was planning to, to go a little bit more into the nitty-gritty of uh, statistics and data collection. Um, and Dorothy made a few points that are excellent and that I want to, to, to tackle on to and even also on, on, on the youth breakdown. Uh, there's some important things to say. So at ITU, we collect two types of data. We have telecommunication data uh, that look at the supply side of, of ICTs, so they really look at, at, at access and uptake of it. And then we collect household data uh, coming from surveys on the, on, on the demand side. And, and that's where it gets interesting and at the same time very challenging. So we've seen that in the current list there are very many indicators. Uh, I'd like to give a warning about the statistical reality of this, especially for the quantitative indicators. Uh, statistical capacity, especially in developing countries, is often very low. And for a lot of these indicators, we actually still do need surveys. There are certainly alternative data sources that can be used and that will be used, especially in the future, because we're not really there yet. But when you want to look at issues of gender, age, you need these socioeconomic breakdowns, and those, for the moment, you only get them through surveys. And surveys are very hard to do, very costly to do, and uh, many countries don't have regular IST surveys in place. So this is, this is, I think, a very important point, the statistical capacity to um, do these indicators. The point related to that is, is the methodology. Um, even if it's going to be country assessments, you still want to have, make some kind of comparison with what's happening in other countries. So you need to make sure that countries are using the methodology. And that goes back again to the statistical capacity issue. Uh, Countries need to understand the methodology. They need to work together with the international organizations, uh, such as ITU, but also UIS. And uh, there are others as well for other indicators. Um, and this requires a, a big effort. So I, I do see this as a very useful template, although I think there are too many indicators and it really needs to be cut down, uh, maybe even substantially. But uh, I've seen the work on the media development indicators and the work that you're doing there, go to a country, work with the country, and let's say fill in the template, that is very useful. It will still be challenging on many of the indicators that require access. And I want to finish by uh, saying one other thing. We are, ITU is part of the, and UNESCO as well, the UIS, together with a lot of other organizations, we are part of the member of the Partnership on Measuring IST for Development. Within that partnership, we are currently looking in developing a thematic list of IST indicators to see how ICT contributes to the SDGs and which indicators uh, can be used to, to, to monitor progress in that. So this is kind of complementary to, 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 to your work, but it, it will certainly use a lot of the same indicators, although we go also into other areas. But uh, David is working with us on that as well. So we will certainly look at the indicators, but it's maybe also we can make some cross-cutting remarks there. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. Uh, we really look forward to that continued work with you. 
So our, our next and our final sort of uh, input uh, from our, our guests we asked specifically to prepare is Mr. Raul, Raul and I, I hope I'm not massacring your name. Uh, 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 do I say Echibera? Echibera. Echeverria. 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 I apologize for that. No, no, so, that's so I, I, I want to tell you something about this man because actually he is Vice President for Global Engagement at ISOC. But he goes back a long way because he was one of the first to lead the project to connect the internet network at, in Uruguay outside of the universities. So I'm not commenting on his age. I think he's still younger than me. But this shows you um, the background he has. But he uh, actually got interested in this idea of indicators for this internet uh, uh, story with UNESCO way back before we even started this particular project because he helped us. Uh, work with uh, CGI.br and LACNIC when he was ahead of it to see what was the other research on the internet. So we were able to map. So the whole idea of this is not to duplicate and uh, not to replace, but to see how can we complement, piggyback, accommodate, and so on. So, so Raul was very uh, helpful in getting that first phase research done. And now, as, a, uh, as I said, one of the groups that supports the current phase is ISOC of uh, which he is, as I said, the Vice President of Global Engagement, and CEDA. So, uh, Raul, uh, thank you so much for all your support of this thing. I, I think clearly this elephant, uh, if we say that the elephant has a stomach, uh, it also has a heart, and I would say you're part of the beating heart of this <laughs> elephant with the four legs that we're trying to measure how to move the elephant forward. Okay, thank you, Guy, for your kind words. I have to think about being the heart of the elephant, uh, what it's <laughs> if it is something good. <laughs> um, I think that's the, one of the of the beauties of this uh, of this work that you have done is uh, is the this uh, integrated approach, the Rome approach, to have all the all those pieces together because we we have been accustomed to work with uh, some of those pieces in, separately, but now. Uh, we have a, a model for um, dealing with all the things together, rights and uh, multi-stakeholder approach and gender things and all the openness and all the other things. So the, uh, and if you look at the, the, the variety, I, I, I planned to speak about that, but David already did when he uh, showed the example, the, 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 uh, the, the, the subcategories, the themes and examples of, for each of the, of the areas. Uh, you, you can appreciate the, the variety of the indicators that I think that cover almost everything. So I think that this is great, and <coughs> obviously the, the, the real value of, uh, of this will be the, in, the, in the implementation. Uh, some people will use all set of the, of the indicators, and others will use subsets of them. That's, this is also one of the, uh, of the interesting things of this is that the, due to the, the broad variety of indicators, you have different options for, uh, for using them. Uh, I love the inclusion of the multi-stakeholder component here because uh, this, obviously, this will be a motivation for, uh, for the countries, uh, for making improvements, for <laughs> gathering data, for measuring things, uh, but also for, for improving against themselves and against the, the average of the international community. And I think that we all agree that's uh, one of the of the challenges uh, for in for making progress on the internet governance in general is uh, is implementing multi-stakeholder process at the local level, and this will bring the uh, the topic to the attention of the governments uh, by including uh, this component in the indicators. And the, one of the of the challenges I see here is uh, is the, that that we will see after the, you run the pilot that, the, that there are some indicators that will not uh, work for every government. But we will see that at some point. I, I have realized some things, for example, the, in, uh, in, in access in the A2 in page uh, 17, is, uh, is there a legal right to access the internet and online services? Um, this is, I know I could put many examples of, of countries where all the stakeholders, including government, are, have been very active in promoting universal access, but I don't know about the existence of uh, some uh, a legal right. So it doesn't, it doesn't mean that the, this is uh, something that prevents the, the, the stakeholders and governments to, uh, to really take that uh, seriously. So uh, we will have probably some, uh, some 
countries will uh, will raise uh, what uh, they could uh, uh, find contradictions. Um, same uh, with the E3. Uh, our services available which enable citizens to access and use local scripts and languages online. And we have to be uh, conscious that in some cases this is not up to the local communities and local governments because some languages are very difficult to be coded and and the, the countries, the, the governments are in some cases, I could use some examples but I will uh, I will avoid to do that uh, in, in, to avoid the mistakes. But the the in some cases the, the governments and local communities are working hard for making those uh, the, the available the scripts, but it it, it is not uh, possible yet. So I think that uh, we should probably measure what's the 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 actions that they are taking. Of this is a priority for 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 the country uh, instead of the, the availability of the. Of, of those uh, services. And uh, same with, uh, with the uh, multi-holder um, participation, I think that's, I, I just will raise one point that I think the, is the C3 uh, that's about participation in ICANN. I think that should be more generic, uh, not only about ICANN, but uh, about other, um, I don't think that's, that, that it is important that governments <coughs> participate in the, in, the, in the governmental advisory committee, but it's important that they participate in many other uh, environments, in the uh, regional conferences on, um, on information society and internet related issues and other, and, and some of the data, I, I think I, I didn't read it in detail all the indicators and sub indicators, but for example, that this is shows that how some of the, of, of the, of the data could be difficult to, to obtain. Uh, for example, membership of an active participation in ICANN constituents in uh, working groups and other fora. Uh, in some cases, this is very dispersed, and uh, especially for medium and, and big countries, uh, it could be very difficult to obtain all the information about who is participating, uh, because sometimes we see that people is participating here, but they don't know each other, they don't know about the participation of the others. So I think that this is an example of how some of the indicators could be m difficult to measure, but I think that we will see all this in detail after the, 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 the pilot where the, 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 uh, we get the information about the countries and how difficult it has been for them for, to, to self-assess. Or, or, uh, thank you very much. And, and as my colleague said recently, I admire the, the work that you have done. This is great. Internet Society is one of the organizations that is looking forward to use this, uh, uh, those indicators. So congratulations and big thank you for the work you have done. And thanks to you too. So uh, thank you for all the panelists. I think let's take a, a bit of uh, response here and then let's also see if we have any remote uh, questions and then we'll ask David to make a response and then we'll ask the other colleagues if they have a final statement uh, here and then um, my colleague introduced. We have um, 25 minutes, so that's some good time. So we have uh, somebody at the back there and then somebody in the front here and then somebody there. So let's yeah, take a round four. of three and four. Let's, Okay, and five, okay. So let's take those five people in that order, then we'll take remote, and then, um, and then we take another round of questions. Mm. So I think we started um, with the man way down there. Yes, please. Uh, 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 him, yeah. I'm sorry, you'll be in the next, next round. The man with the glasses. Uh, Tom McKenzie, I work for a consultancy firm um, in Paris. Um, I, I think this is really fascinating work that you're doing, uh, and um, I really look forward to the, uh, to the final report that you will be producing. Uh, the question I have regards the format uh, of the information that you're going to be producing, the, this, this data uh, that you're producing, and how, easily, how easy it will be for um, end users uh, of this information to, 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 cro to cross-reference it, uh, to take different indicators, um, uh, and to see uh, so that they can track what's of particular interest to them. Um, and so there are very good example. there are very good ways of doing that. Uh, you know, the whole open data uh, movement, um, uh, there are good examples at the OECD of how they've put a lot of statistical information, uh, made a lot of statistical information available to a large number of people, which we can then cross as, 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 we, will, as we like. Um, is that your intention um, uh, w with, this, with this statistical data? In which case, I would find it will be extremely useful. Thank you so much for that comment. And then there was this gentleman over here. Yeah, to, to make it, uh, 
thank you very much. Uh, you know, my name is Bhaskar Bhattacharji. I came from Bangladesh and as a ISOC ambassador, and I am a blind person. I am not seeing any of you. So uh, this report, I think, I should get in accessible format. If you have some in accessible format, such as um, accessible PDF or other things, please um, forward it to me, then I can read. But what I understand, you know, one of the biggest challenges in the globe, that is uh, one billion people are ignored to receive um, <clears throat> accessible information through internet. And we found um, this is the biggest barrier. In my country also, we have our government uh, running like 25,000 websites. We are not finding a single website which are accessible for people with disabilities. So um, day by day, technology is improving, but same time it is creating some barrier for the people with disabilities. If you look about this, um, so how your study are going to focus on the disability issues and people with disabilities, there is a concept, nothing about us without us, how we are engaging them through, throughout your uh, study. And if there is any scope, we are very happy to collaborate with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, who was number three right over here? Uh, my name is Giuliano, and I work at <coughs> uh, the CGI.br advisory team. And uh, first, I would like to congratulate I mean, the initiative and the work done. And uh, <coughs> I have a few comments on many of the indicators. That's the first time that I, I'm getting in touch with the okay. work, and but I will concentrate on uh, internet governance and mood stakeholderism indicators. So uh, I I don't know what's the construct behind those indicators, but I think they are quite government driven, and, and I, uh, internet governance mood stakeholderism has not been led by government. On the contrary, government is, is running after internet governance. And, and then I think that, that should be looked carefully because otherwise the, the result on, on these indicators would be uh, how government uh, uh, support internet governance in countries. And, 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 and this has nothing to do what internet history is. Mm. Then it, it's very important to, to look carefully on, on that. And uh, uh, I totally agree with um, uh, uh, Mr. Chibaria. I don't know what the comment of uh, Raul uh -huh. on that, that would be important to include other um, internet governance ecosystem uh, environments than, other than ICON. I mean, ICON is very important, but we have IETF. <coughs> this is very important to understand uh, how uh, uh, the community of the countries are participating in IETF, where uh, internet protocols are, are, are being produced. Then if we are talking about uh, uh, human rights by design, if you are not participating in IETF, then how can we reach for something so important like that? And uh, uh, finally, I, I, I was kind of bewildered. My colleague, the colleague uh, behind me has made a, a point on that, but the, the term uh, accessibility refers to the design of the technologies, the design of the protocols, and has nothing to do with uh, how far internet access has reached the countries. And, and I was looking for accessibility indicators in, in, the, session, in the session accessibility, but I, I couldn't find anyone and that. And it's good that our friend here has brought the issue. And, or you change the name accessibility, or you include an accessibility indicators module for uh, debating. I mean, it's so important that we have in CGI of your uh, one, uh, I whole uh, work on accessibility on the web and and so, and well, I have more uh, okay. things that on, on, on indicators here. I will start we, we, participating if you'd please, like to. Please, that will be excellent. And uh, well, I, I'll give you a, after my card and, okay, and then you. we can talk later Super. a little bit more. Super, okay. thank you. Those are, those are, are points that uh, we will, um, <coughs> yeah, there is, a, there is a section, but uh, we'll come back when we respond. Uh, I think it's. 
Right. Okay, uh, that's, uh, Edmund Chung, yeah. and then we come to the remote, and then we take a second round. Yeah. Uh, Edmund Chung here uh, from Dot Asia. We're very excited about the, the development. In fact, uh, especially building on, uh, we're, we're actually launching what we call a youth mobility index, and within which uh, we define what we call digital mobility. And a lot of uh, there's a lot of overlap actually on, on some of the uh, indicators here. And actually, uh, Guy and I have been talking about this over the last uh, couple months, uh, and we see a lot of overlap, which is which is great. Um, and and one of the things that 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 was mentioned is that this is not in intended to be uh, a, a, a comparis comparative study, and I understand that that is specifically for the framework, but I guess one, one of the questions is, we are interested in, in you know, uh, making, uh, doing some, some quantitative, uh, pulling out some of the quantitative analysis uh, components of it and doing some uh, comparative studies, like for example, the different uh, countries or localities around Asia. And in fact, some of the elements uh, in the indicators also indicate that you should uh, look at uh, 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 how it how the country compares with the global uh, average or uh, some other countries as well. So I, I, I guess my question is whether um, you see that there is any barriers or, or, or that it shouldn't be, be used at all. I understand the intent for the particular framework is not for, but is there any uh, reason why it cannot be? Uh, and, and, and that's one. And then two, two specific comments. Uh, one is that it's interesting that um, there is no particular component on, uh, not, not a strong component on like uh, the commercial side of things, uh, e-commerce uh, uh, data, uh, things like payment or, or fin financial side of things. Uh, except for the very or, or, uh, uh, overarching uh, items on GDP and those kind of things, but that that might be something interesting, mm. like like e-commerce. There's and one. There's one, but but it's not very uh, prominent. That's so. That's one thing. The other thing, in terms of the uh, internet penetration or, or the rate, one is one thing is interesting. You you focused a lot on the cost and the the coverage. But what about the speed? Because uh, it's a bit of a component of the speed in terms of cost and, and, and coverage as well. So I think you know speed would be really interesting. Um, so um, with that, I guess again, I go back to I think it, I think this is a framework that 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 works very well with with what we're doing with digital mobility and and youth mobility uh, uh, index that that we're coming up with scores and in comparative. Uh, I'd love to uh, get a sense that this is also you know we. we we're not breaking the, <laughs> the Rome framework by, uh, by utilizing a lot of these indicators in, uh, in comparative studies. Mm -hmm. and, and one final point is that uh, I think what Raul said, um, we, until we do some pilots, we really can't uh, nail down the actual uh, way of uh, 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 collecting the data and uh, actual things. So a few pilots will re really pave the way in how actually we, we collect the data. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Let's take our online um, remote question and then we'll... Uh, thank you, Guy. Um, we actually have a total of uh, six or seven online participation, and um, I think they are following us. One quick, one quick question from uh, Ting Ting Liu, Liu Ting Ting. Uh, I'm not sure which category of indicator she was ask, asking, but perhaps uh, on right of privacy, because she's asking, is it possible for individuals to have their own database and to control in future which companies or other individuals could have the access. Okay, so uh, let's take a second round of, uh, of comments and questions, and again we'll 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 sum up. At the, so the gentleman over there, the next gentleman over here, over there, over there. Any anything? Anybody else? I think because that'll we'll have to close the list then. Okay, so number one and uh, number two, number three, four, five. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, Dennis Redek, I'm a researcher and also the uh, co-founder of, of an NGO that works in the Pacific with small island states. And I think it's particularly interesting in the, in the context of this, um, of this exercise. And I want to can congratulate uh, for the great work you've been doing. Um, but when I think about the particularly Pacific island states, um, small island states, it's, um, these are only a couple of million people, and yet there, there are quite many of the UNESCO member states. Um, and I've, if I look at the indicators, I feel that many of those um, can probably not be readily uh, been collected. So I'm, I'm wondering very much what your um, take on this is, particularly 
with regard to um, capacities of statistical offices uh, and how the collection can uh, can be arranged. Uh, and then with regard to some of the indicators, uh, particularly those that um, measure uh, broadband fixed uh, lines, that obviously is something that doesn't necessarily apply to the geography of some of the small island states where a fixed line does, doesn't necessarily make sense, but a mobile line makes much more sense. So um, the question whether there is uh, alternative indicators for some of states where this doesn't uh, make so much sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much. My name is uh, Abu Bakar Karsan from Tanzania. I am the executive director of the Union of Tanzania Press Clubs. I have two comments. Number one, I think the um, indicators for people with disabilities should be extensively researched because there are different kind of disabilities, apart from those who can't see, but there are some uh, people with disabilities that then they don't have legs, they don't have uh, uh, hands, so how do they access internet? Uh, an indicator should be really put over there. Number two, uh, indicators about countries that are quite very dictatorial. Uh, we see a tendency now of various countries, uh, sometimes in the past they were free, but now the freedom is being curtailed. We have to be very uh, careful in how we involve those countries in coming up with uh, indicators. You can see now a country like Tanzania, which was a little bit free, but we have a new president who is quite very dictatorial. He's shutting the media, and uh, there is a very bad cyber law, which is limiting people in accessing internet. So we have a little bit very careful uh, on how we prepare our indicators. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I'm Andrea Calderaro, member of uh, the advisory group of the project. Um, so, I mean, of course, we, we I join all colleagues here saying that the project is fantastic, ambitious, and uh, let me also add that it is a uh, um, it's a great adding value that this, uh, this um, the project because it looks not only at the access and the quality of access, but uh, probably is one of the first uptime to look at also and the uh, quality of uh, uh, contributions to the internet, uh, the capacity of people to shape the internet uh, to 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 produce contents online. That's uh, it uh, should be obvious because we. That's why we like the internet, but it's uh, usually under 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 measure and under assessed. But uh, because of that, probably I mean, of course, I agree that we already have lots of indicators, and probably the the the, the next phase will be the main challenge will be to simplify the 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 the, the, the monitor and the way in which we assess uh, internet universality. But um, we need probably to my advice is, uh, and we, of course, we're going to have uh, other 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 moments to discuss this more in details, would be to um, work on the indicators uh, measuring the content production. Here I see, for example, we look at registered domains, but probably uh, these data will be always uh, falsified by the cyber squatting uh, that uh, uh, we have to deal with. Uh, I don't know, probably somebody from ICANN can help us to give us some dimensions of the cyber squatting, but in many countries worldwide we do have a, a high number of registered domain which don't tell us nothing about the, the actual contents online. And um, there are of course many other ways to measure online contents and uh, in some cases we need to uh, mm, ask help of internet service providers or of internet intermediaries. And this goes, uh, in a, with, which is another comment and probably an, a, a suggestion that I have. It will be probably difficult for uh, countries, individual countries, to, asset, to, to, to collect those kind of data because it will be difficult for them to find the, the agreement uh, or the collaboration with these big internet service providers. So it might be the case uh, uh, that some of the indicators, especially when we talk about the quantitative indicators, will be collected uh, in a centralized way by UNESCO, hope, I hope, and uh, and uh, and that would be also important because uh, you're gonna secure that the the, the 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 collection of data will happen in a rigorous way because you're gonna and it's gonna be pretty easy easy work to do because you're gonna collect data by World Bank, by, I mean reliable sources of course, 
and then eventually leave uh, the, all uh, the qualitative part of the collection of data when we, of course, we need to assess uh, uh, all the regulatory and legal aspects of uh, uh, internet indicators uh, to, the, to, the, to the country. And in this way, we can also uh, give uh, an incentive to uh, local actors because we say, you're going to say, UNESCO has collected this bunch of data. Please help us to, to feed this monitor in a, on a, from your side. This is my okay, comment. thank you. I, I have to ask the colleagues to be short because we are now beginning to run out of time. Hello. Uh, dear all, thank you so much for your tremendous job. And uh, as you also mentioned, yeah, we've really uh, taken this questionnaire. We share it among our uh, young people in the civil society in Russia. I, I represent the Russian NGO. Also, I'm a PhD in global governance, and of course, I am more uh, interested in such indicators as multi-stakeholder. Um, and uh, I believe that there should be some distribution of roles and responsibilities so that there is no abuse of power in any country or community, because I believe that uh, internet governance should really be founded uh, in a three-level model with international organizations, technical community, uh, governmental level, and civil society level. And I believe that it should be really uh, strongly voiced in these indicators. What is uh, probably also needed is some uh, UN legal framework or convention or such indicator can be among the cross-cutting indicators. Also, what I also mentioned on the zero day, um, I strongly believe that uh, such indicator as security uh, you, you kindly put it to uh, um, on the page 29 is group D, yes, trust and security, but probably I, I think that security has the potential to be a, a separate indi indicator because if you even look to this program, yes, of the event, it's all about cyber security and stuff, and I believe it's uh, the biggest threat we have. And also, so it's a remark to indicators. My question is how to get involved in testing the indicators, how we as civil society can be helpful, how, which groups, expert groups we can join. So please tell us. We're very excited. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Our last speaker here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrea Beccali. I work for ICANN. And um, um, I'll have a comment and a, and a question. But first, I have to say that uh, I'm happy to see that UNESCO doesn't shy away from challenges. And, uh, and this, this is a clearly a challenge, and it's a good one. Um, but my comment, and I'm, and I'm still going around that, is that um, well, the internet as a network of networks is, is by its own technical definition borderless. And many of those indicators are based on a national data gathering. So I'm trying to see how you can combine the two things and also different layers of that. When, uh, here, we don't define the internet, but we, the indicators, some of them, they go into the application level. Some of them, they go to the infrastructure level. Some of them go into the participation level. And those different levels, they also have components and data that are completely independent from one country uh, or a single stakeholder group. Um, and, and this one is also, I think, a component. But the question is here is whether the fragmentation part of the internet is, is um, in with, in within the internet universality. Because what I see here, Probably one of the major threats of the internet that we are seeing is that the whole global single network in these recent years is becoming more and more um, compartmentalized at the technical level, at the application level, which it's a di very different pictures on what the internet we knew only five years ago or ten years ago. So whether the universality indicators also look in this uh, dimension, how they can put it out. And last comment that I have is the, and probably is more the statistician that could tackle that, is the time sensitive of the data gathering. Uh, many of those indicators, they change by probably the seconds. And uh, you take a snapshot of those data, but maybe, you know, five minutes after things yeah. may really influence. So how do you com combine that into, into that? That's so uh, we, we are really, really running out of time, but I noticed the gender imbalance in questions, and there's two women who have indicated. So I think I, I have to sacrifice the comments of my uh, panelists here to get the two comments from the two women in the audience. So um, I think you indicated first, and you indicated. 
Please, very short, because we have basically one minute uh, left. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Council of Europe. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate UNESCO on this excellent um, um, uh, set of indicators. The project looks incredibly interesting, even in this phase, but it's still in progress. Uh, so, um, but um, my question reg regards to uh, the, prop the expected follow-up. I understand the... Uh, uh, the indicators will be uh, presented formally in September next year to IPDC. And uh, my question is, uh, what is the expected follow-up? In which way UNESCO would like to plan to encourage uh, states to, to elaborate actually national reports and uh, gather data, exchange of, uh, of information? I think this is really um, a crucial point. As you may know, uh, the Council of Europe uh, elaborated uh, its own set of indicators, Internet Freedom Indicators, in uh, April uh, uh, 2016. Uh, and we have uh, first uh, national reports, but I'm sure that you are aware of this. Uh, um, and so we observe that it's really uh, crucial information to, to engage in the um, supporting implementation. So I would like to hear from you about it. Can you Thank repeat you. which country? Council of Europe. Council of Europe. Thank you. Hi, my name is Yoko Hatada. I'm a founder and director of EMSRI, which is Evolution of Mind Life Society Research Institute. And I'm looking at it from the evolvability perspective. And because IGF could be international, and actually I'm not sure this is covered by your responsibility. Maybe somewhere else is a responsibility. Just I'm asking. Uh, like, you know, for example, if we can make a s some kind of uh, law which every country can uh, collaboratively uh, uh, help each other to, to share, for example, uh, environmental issue, which is uh, so many disaster, natural disaster or um, health issue, like a en pan pandemic epidemic occur, and then those basic bottom line of the, like a, like a temperature fluctuation or uh, uh, rainfall, or, you know, all sorts of things, if we have a data set, and then if we, everybody in the world can observe those data, and then when they're seeing, you know, the temperature goes up, is it out of range of stability of nature? And mm -hmm. those uh, local people's uh, understanding of the, yeah. uh, the river is drying up or, you know, for, for, for flooding, etc. Those kind of local and as well as uh, international data, if we can share, and then also like a sea and air could be, like, you know, there's a, some kind of gap between. So, and, but uh, those knowledge as well as together with the uh, national uh, security safety or the, um, not only very attacking or uh, negative side, but knowing and helping each other can create a mm -hmm. real uh, positive side of the international collaboration, and if uh, IGF uh, can uh, contribute or somewhere else, the role. Okay. So, uh, I mean, clearly we can't respond to all these questions. We now have to stop our, our workshop. But uh, I, I could uh, say two things. One is, please uh, amplify your points uh, on, our, on our website. Um, we will, in, uh, I hope, uh, about 10 days, have an interactive interface. But you can also just send a little memo, if you want. Uh, we would love to continue working with you. If you want us to keep in touch, please put your, your, your um, email there. We will not spam you, but we will keep you informed on this. We really value these questions. This uh, 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 still has some way to go with uh, further comments and then the pre-testing and then the piloting. And then we hope in, in 2019 it's really ready to roll for whoever wishes to make use of all or part of it. So if you watch also the website, you'll see different ways we can, you can continue to be involved in input. We, th we think that these indicators can really represent the global wisdom and be very useful to the maximum number of, of stakeholders. So uh, I think with that... Uh, the Sorry to, sorry to block your lunch time. We have, uh, we have uh, someone, uh, Awa Tata from ISOC Nigeria. Um, I'll, uh, she said, I would like to say that uh, in gathering data, emphasis should also be made on extracting information about the actual feel, feelings of the user base. It is one thing a technical says, it provides so speed 
to its internet uh, subscribers. It's another thing to actually verify that uh, with the user end and across a um, broad spectrum of locations. Right. Okay, thank you. And that's my colleague, uh, Jean Hong Hu, who uh, has put together this panel, so thank you very much. And my other colleague, uh, Guilherme, is he there? Guilherme, he had to leave. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I want to thank them, and I want to thank you all because this is really important. Uh, my colleague here, uh, David, well, not my colleague, but our <laughs> consultant on this, has been taking extensive notes, and he has, says he has one, one short uh, response. Uh, just I think that um, you know we very much welcome as much input as you, as you can possibly give, and I just say a couple of things. Um, first, there are no perfect questions, there are no perfect indicators, there are no perfect answers. Um, and uh, so we shouldn't be searching for perfection here. We should be searching for what is feasible to do in the majority of countries. Um, and similarly, we can't be comprehensive. We have to um, focus on the things that will give us the collage of evidence we need to assess national internet environments uh, effectively. Um, but um, I think we can achieve something that is really useful as the media development indicators have been in the past. Please do accompany us and at the next IGF, uh, please, we will have another workshop and you can get updated further and see how much we have been able to improve from today. Really value your participation and uh, we look forward to the outcome of these indicators. Thank you, have a good lunch. Just come for training. Congratulations on your promotion. <laughs>